Hello and welcome everyone to DRJ's webinar series. I'm Bob Arnold, President here at Disaster Cover Journal. Today's sponsor is Everbridge and the topic is an update on the COVID-19 pandemic, the top 10 things you need to be doing right now. Before we get started, I wanna review a couple housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded. This recording will be shared with everyone tomorrow via an automated email. Attendees are also in a listen only mode. If you would like to ask any questions, please use the question panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll answer as many of these questions as possible at the end of the session. Now back to today's topic on an update on the COVID-19 crisis facing the world today and the top 10 things you should uh, be doing right now. Our presenter today is Regina Phelps with Emergency Management and Safety Solutions. Regina is an internationally recognized expert in the field of crisis management pandemic and continuity planning and exercise design. Since 1982, she has provided consultation and speaking services to clients on five continents. She is the founder of Emergency Management and Safety Solutions, a consulting company specializing in crisis management, exercise design and continuity and pandemic planning. With no further introductions, I'd like to welcome, turn the mic over to Regina. Great, Bob, thanks so much. And thank you for that kind introduction. First of all, let me say it's a real pleasure to be with all of you today to talk about the top 10 things your organization must be doing right now in order to manage the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. But let me first begin by acknowledging each and every one of you for your tremendous work in helping your organizations prepare for this challenge and for what we're likely to face in the days and weeks ahead. Your contributions, your commitment, are going to help ensure that your employees are safe and your organization will continue after this pandemic has passed. And after all, that is what we do in the work of crisis management and business continuity planning. Thank you. Let's take a look at my agenda. Oops. I'm gonna give you a very short update about where we are looking at the numbers and a little bit of um, theory behind that. I wanna talk about what I call pandemic planning guidance and specifically to talk about some new pandemic planning phases that my company has been working on. And I'd like to share those with you today. I'd like to share with you the top 10 things you need to be doing right now. And then I always want to end with some personal and family preparedness because after all, diseases are personal. And then we'll of course take questions. So what's our update right this moment? So if you of course go to the John Hopkins sites, I'm sure all of you do with some frequency. I start my morning every day at 4 a.m. by going to that site. And there's a couple things I'm just gonna point out right away that are different about the, the view that you see now. This is actually from 10, 12 Pacific. So that's literally about 45 minutes ago. And the first thing I wanna call out to you is the death toll. As you can see, worldwide has now passed 20,000. So it's at 20,000, almost 500. The total confirmed cases worldwide is 451,000 and change. We are now at 172 countries and regions. You'll find that number almost in the middle at the bottom. There's only 195 or 197, depending on who you ask, countries or regions in the world. So we're almost everywhere. And then when you look at the map, I just want to point out a couple of things. Looking at North America, you can see that the United States is filling in pretty rapidly with cases, uh, driven a lot by what's happening in the West. Initially, that was Washington and California. I'm based in San Francisco, so I'm part of that red dot in California. Uh, and then if you go to the East, of course, you'll see the incredible explosion occurring in the Northern Eastern seaboard, nor uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, but now spreading, as you can see, south and going west. And if you look at the rest of the map, a couple of highlights, South America has really started to explode with cases as well. As well. We do a lot of work in South America, and I will tell you that uh, many of the countries have been closed doing shelter at place at home uh, since last Monday. Africa is also beginning to light up, and when you stop and look at those two continents in particular, South America and Africa, one of the concerns that many of us have is the uh, death toll that could occur in those two areas because in many parts of those continents there is limited health care. And then lastly looking at Australia and you'll see Australia has got a lot of cases that are developing on the eastern coast and then also off to Perth as well in the west. And then the last thing I want to point out about the map 
and that's the yellow line in the lower right hand corner. And as you can see, that's the case count. And as you can also see, that case count is shooting straight up. There are many different models I know that you've been looking at. I certainly look at a bunch every day, uh, many different um, um, views of this, but I want to share with you uh, the death rate as uh, organized, and this is from the New York Times. And by the way, the New York Times has removed their paywall for any COVID-19 um, news reporting, and they have some really, really excellent uh, materials. This one in particular talks about the death rate as we see it. And what I want to point out is, is the United States, which is this orange line that you see right here. Now, as you can see, uh, when you look at that line, you'll go up and see that we're at about 700 or so cases right now, 750 cases of death of people that have died. And our death rate is currently doubling every three days. So we're going to see exponential growth if this continues as this uh, pandemic continues. I would uh, draw your attention, I'm sure you've seen this in many models, that we're on the same line as Italy, and they currently right now have the highest death rate in the world. So let's talk for a moment a little about some pandemic planning guidance. And if you look at our field in business continuity and pandemic planning, there's kind of two usual phases that people look through, planning phases. The classic ones in business continuity have these four phases. We plan, we detect something, then we respond appropriately, and then we recover. On the pandemic side of the house, the classic CDC phases, there's five. The only real difference is really the investigatory phase at phase one. But if you're a continuity planner or a pandemic planner or a crisis manager, you look at those and you think, well, gosh, that doesn't help me much with what we're facing right now. And I would agree. And so I've been noodling this for the last week or so about how to organize this in a way that would be more helpful for us as planners and people that are responding in companies. And what we've come up is what I believe are seven phases of how we need to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me just peel these back for you here. Starting at number one, planning, of course, planning are all those things you should, notice the word should, have done prior to December 31st, 2019. Uh, so that would be not only business continuity plans, crisis management plans, crisis communications plan, but also, of course, a pandemic plan. And I will say to you right now that pretty much the time for planning, advanced planning, is well beyond us. Awareness, depending on where you were in the world, became apparent to you as far as the COVID threat was concerned, probably around the beginning part of January. So the threat began to emerge at the end of December. My clients who have a lot of work in Asia started to really pay attention and many of them stood up their teams starting in the middle of January. So we've had teams that have been operational now for over two months in our client population. So that awareness is really important. And for some people though, it's only been really in the last few weeks that they've really been following this. The third phase is the activation and response. I hope all of you have done this. That's standing up your crisis management team activate your business continuity and pandemic plans. Uh, and as the threat's gonna grow, we're going to potentially expand and change our teams, our plans and our structures. But now I'm gonna introduce uh, what I think is, a, a, is the fourth phase of this pandemic response. And the ones in red, of course, are the ones that are not traditional. I'm calling it reevaluation. Now, yes, indeed, in our field, we reevaluate things all the time. I mean, that's what we do in a crisis. But I'm talking about it from a very much of a different place. And this is what I'm calling a continual and deeper, I really want to emphasize the word deeper reassessment. And so you should be asking yourself every single day, what are the top mission critical functions that I absolutely positively must continue? And my bet for many of you is this is going to change a lot over time. Now, why do we have to do this kind of deep dive and reevaluation that we don't necessarily have to do in other types of crises? And I'll tell you, it's because a pandemic is different in three different ways that require this continual reevaluation. The first really is the nature of the crisis. This is a disease. It can affect every single person on this call. It can affect every single person in this world, your family, your friends, your community, your country. And it's different because we have to then think about the personal effects. And frankly, many people may be sick, maybe many people will die. It's a very different response than a hurricane, which of course has deaths, but nothing like this. The second is the scope. It's global in nature. 
It's not just your company or the region or the country, it's the world. And the world will be in this in different phases and will be suffering at different times, but all the same, it's the world. And then lastly is the duration. We're talking about an extensive period of time. There are no continuity plans written for this. I'll just tell you that right now. You, of course, already know that. We're talking about weeks and weeks, months and months. And if it's anything like a influenza pandemic, this could have up to three waves and it could last between 12 and 18 months. And by waves, I mean that there'll be times of peak intense human to human transmission, and then that will drop down and then it will peak up again. So we're not gonna be in a continual grind for 12 to 18 months, but it will be a lot of up and down and a lot of re-evaluation. So you will have to constantly keep asking yourself what's critical. And if you started with a list of 100 mission critical items, maybe by the time you're day 30, you might be down to 50. And then maybe by the time you're day 45, you might only have 15. Because as you have less staff available, less uh, opportunities or, or resources available, you're gonna constantly keep asking the question, what's important? That goes to number five on my list of the pandemic phases for COVID-19. And this is actually kind of has two parts to it, but I think it will happen simultaneously. We are, by the way, not there yet. We are deeply in the reevaluation phase right now, and we're gonna be there for a while, um, probably at least another couple weeks. By the time we get into the cocoon phase, this means, and, 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 I would, and this is really from the tactical response of a company, this is really almost like what I would call a medically induced coma. So what do I mean by that? Once we have preserved our critical functions and we know exactly what those are, and we are hunkering down, we're gonna do everything possible to keep those functional, but we are basically kind of silent on all other actions. So we are hunkered down. And what we're trying to do is just keep the basic things happening. But simultaneously, you need to have another team of individuals who are planning reentry. So there's a whole group of people that are just keeping the, the person breathing, that's the medically induced coma, and you need a group of people that will be doing reentry planning. How are we gonna restart our business? And I think you'll be doing those things simultaneously. I do wanna mention that the reentry planning really has two distinct levels. I call out strategic only in the slides, but frankly, it's really both. Your executive teams are gonna be seriously looking at the business and asking many deep and probing questions about whether you would be do doing mergers or acquisitions, whether you would be expanding the business or contracting it, whether you might be decreasing your size or increasing your size. There'll be lots of big strategic issues that they're going to opine on. And your tactical team is going to be thinking about how to start all of that up, including the feedback from the executives about the, what's important and what's not. Then what we'll have is the reentry phase, which is very similar to what we normally do in our sort of post-disaster. We dig out of the cocoon, we get going, we, we have our plans in hand, and we start. But then lastly, I think in this pandemic, we're actually going to have a seventh phase, and that's what I'm calling at this point reinvention. And that is that once we start up, we're likely to emerge from this experience changed. Personally, uh, your family, our communities, our cities, our countries, and your business. And I think we will start asking ourselves the question, are we doing, should we be doing anything differently? So for example, if you've been successfully working at home with a large number of people, do you automatically just bring everybody back? Do you somehow turn that into some merged opportunity? I think what will happen is that we will have the opportunity to reinvent ourselves in ways that we've never thought about before, or what we might've thought was too radical based on our current business practice. So I think now things might be somewhat different. So I wanna talk about the top 10 things that you need to be doing, but before I do that, I wanna give you some assumptions here because of course, you know, as planners, we always have a series of planning assumptions. I am making a lot of assumptions about you. I am making assumptions that you have activated your crisis management team, that you've activated your business continuity program, that you're already doing extensive communication with your key stakeholders, and that you're working with your customers, and that you're managing to the best of your ability how to continue your business in the current situation. 
I'm going to heap on top of that 10 more things I want you to be doing and thinking about. And you'll see my list here. I'm not going to spend any time on this slide, but just to summarize where we're going, and then I'm going to dig right in with my, my number one option, which is situational awareness. There is no way that your executive team and your tactical team, so dividing in our terminology, our executive team, our executive crisis management team, which is comprised of individuals working on the strategy issues, and then our tactical team, our tactical crisis management team, who's working on the recovering the tactics. There's no way they can do their job if they don't have information. And so, first of all, you should be having a very effectively done process for doing situational awareness. Let me peel that back. Situational awareness simply means understanding what is going on around you. And that I mean that from the holistic perspective as well as your organization. But that also means your remote workforce. How do you know that they're sick? How do you know that they're well? How do you know that they're doing their job and delivering on their work products? Those are critical things. And, and what you need when you're doing situational awareness is you have very two distinct activities. First of all, you have to collect information and then you have to process it and organize it in some cogent fashion so that you can actually then develop some sort of report so that everybody can see what, you're, what we're doing. So first of all, internally, you need to collect information. And you need to collect information that's going to support situational awareness and understanding. And what do you need to know from all of your company locations? So if you have more than one location, I'm not talking about just collecting this at the mothership at the main headquarters. I'm talking about collecting this from every location that you have. And you'll notice at the bottom of that slide, I'm really focusing on five areas. I always want to know five things about every location. I want to know about their people, I want to understand what's happening to their facilities. I want to know if they have any technology impacts. I want to understand their business operations. Are there any impacts there? And then lastly, is there any impact on their reputation and brand? So this is the type of questions that we've been encouraging our clients to ask every location. So let me just talk about this for a second. Under this concept of people broadly looking at life safety, if you have multiple locations, you might also want to know just a snapshot, give me a few sentences, give me a few words about what's happening in your area. So in many of our clients who have locations all over the world, that can vary greatly. And even within a single country, it can uh, vary greatly. Some areas might be sheltering in place, others may not. Some may have very severe restrictions on movement and activity, others may not. So you need to have some sense about what's happening locally in all of your locations. And then you wanna know, do I have any employees that are ill with COVID-19? Do I have any deaths as a result of that? And do I have people quarantined? It becomes less important now that this is really kicking off worldwide to really understand if it's very different from last year, because more than likely it's going to accelerate beyond your, your previous experience. From a facilities perspective, I really want to understand what's going on in the buildings. Are they open and fully functional? Are they partially open with only category one? And category one, by our definition, are those people that are time sensitive, mission critical, but have to be at work? Or are they closed? So you want to understand what's the status of that building. And then if they are open, do they have any particular issues? Are they getting janitorial service as they're supposed to? Do they have an adequate supply of materials that they need? Are they having any concerns at all with the building and its operation? You want to understand that. The third thing you want to know about, is there any problems they're having with technology? So for example, with many people working from home, there could be latency problems uh, in your overall network. You could have issues related to, maybe you have limited VPN capacity and you're having difficulty getting critical workers online. Uh, there can also be a problem in people's homes where they don't have uh, sufficient coverage and perhaps there's some latency at the home, the, you know, what's called critically the last mile. Have you had any increase in cyber attacks? Many of my clients have gotten just amazing phishing attacks that have been going on. Uh, unbelievable, where the phishing attacks are so sophisticated, getting people to click on just about anything. And then what kind of work from home uh, issues might you be having? Hardware, support, uh, those are critical things you wanna make sure that you're addressing. As far as your business operations, you want to understand uh, what's going on with your business operations. Are you continuing uh, with as business as usual as best you can? 
Are you having some problems? Is there a major impact? Are your remote workers being productive? Are they able to deliver on their deliverables? Um, and if you begin to rethink, again, rethink what happens if you have significant interruptions, going back to what's really, really important and asking yourself that every day. What about supply chain issues? That's becoming a problem now. It's not just the fact that China was shut down anymore. Of course, it's many parts of the world being shut down. And then also under business operations, are you hearing from your customers and perhaps you're having some dissatisfaction, complaints, or concerns? And then lastly, <clears throat> from a perspective of reputation and brand, are you in the news at all? Are you being covered about your response from the pandemic? Uh, are, are people uh, asking about how you're doing? Uh, is there is there any chance you could be part of this news story? So, for example, some of my clients recently donated uh, very large numbers of masks. What a great story they had. And so from a reputation and brand perspective, that was a really positive thing about them and the pandemic. Uh, and hopefully you've got your holding statements ready and that your advisors who might support you remotely have been alerted to your, any status changes that you might have. So that's all the internal data that you actually need from any company, any location. Uh, you need some really solid internal, external sources, excuse me, about health. And so the most common ones that people are routed to always are the WHO, the CDC, John Hopkins, of course. Uh, depending on your local county, you might have some really good county departments of public health that have some good data on those sites. And I would encourage you to check those. And then lastly, uh, Ideally, you've got some sort of relationship with an infectious disease physician in your area or region, because if you have issues as this pandemic uh, goes on, you might need to have some real good expert advice who is an infectious disease certified physician. Externally, you'd also like to get some good news sources. I will tell you that the ones on the screen here, I've been doing the, probably the best example of really good news coverage. So the New York Times, the Washington Post, Bloomberg has done a fabulous job in the area of, of uh, business um, publications. And PR, The Guardian, um, BBC, all of those, very, very good. And then I'd like to also say that if you're using any social media at all, at all, you need to absolutely be sure that you are, are, are being careful and quadruple checking anything you're seeing on social media. There's a lot of really poor information that's out there. So this is an example of a form. We, this is a two-part form, and I'm just showing the first part of it, which is the five, part of three of the five areas. So we always care about people, facilities, technology, of course, business operations, and reputation and brand. This is what we've designed that our clients can use and modify, and they can send it out to all of their locations and then receive that data back to compile their overall situational status board. So think about what kind of form you need to develop in order to send that out to your locations so they can then provide you the data that you would like to have. Once you've got the data, then you have to do something with it. And that's really what's called processing. You need to turn it into some sort of situational status report so that your executives and your tactical crisis management team can see that and then act accordingly. So once you develop this form, you want to make sure that it's disseminated on a daily basis to both your executive crisis management team, your tactical crisis management team. It should also be used to inform and develop your action plans, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then it could also be to develop a, a dashboard for your executives. This is a sample of a dashboard that we have created for our clients. This is a modifiable one that we've sent to people that are in our client population. Um, and so you can see that on the top left-hand side, uh, there's a, a place to include the number of quarantine, uh, infected or uh, deceased employees. And then the column, the two columns next to it, you could have the worldwide numbers, you could have a regional number, you could have a state number, whatever might be applicable for you. Under facility, if you have multiple facilities, you see we have tiers uh, there. And many of our clients are have many different sizes and they're usually dropped into about a three tier format. And they could then list uh, those uh, numbers of tiers as well as the impact in those locations. What's happening in technology? The bottom left hand side is about stories related to you in the news. And then, of course, everything on the right would be looking at business impact, listing the line of business or a particular business process, and then noting the impact by color and then describing it. The thing about a dashboard is it's super helpful for somebody to be able to look at it and get a really quick read and then to focus immediately on the areas that are red in particular, but also possibly yellow, because it gives you some idea of where the vulnerable spots are in your business. 
Number two on my list is conducting highly structured briefings based on situational awareness and your incident action planning process. And again, what I found in my client population who's actually been activated, especially for some time, some of them kind of slid into the activation and they weren't very structured initially, and now they're trying to make up for that. Uh, and others started with a lot of structure and have remained that way. There's huge advantage in being organized and structured in a fast moving, very complicated event. So the briefings that you're having, and ideally you're doing them daily. Uh, I hope your operational periods are at least every 24 hours. Most of my clients are doing them every 24 hours at this point. A couple of key points I'm expecting to see if I was to look into your structure and process. I would wanna see highly structured meetings with a designated moderator whose job is to manage the entire agenda and the entire flow of the call. They should have a written agenda. They go through every, every call. They should call it exactly the flow of the call and how it's going to work. This should not be done, by the way, by the incident commander or the leader of the call, whatever that person is of your crisis management team. They should be basically running key aspects of the meeting, but the structure should be provided by a, a designated moderator. Uh, there should be a very clear and set agenda so that we're super clear about where we're going and what we're doing. And there should also be a designated individual whose job is to capture all of the key objectives or action items that come out of this uh, meeting. And this should be included then into your incident action plan. And you should also be clearly to note who is responsible for each one of those tasks. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So these IAPs, which if you've ever heard me talk about crisis management is I think one of the most important things that companies need to do. And I find that people are sometimes remiss in doing them. I will tell you in an event that goes on for weeks and months, if you don't have a clear, defined, structured planning process, it is gonna be really hard for you to track anything. And so I would beg you, I would beg you to do this. So first of all, you always have to have a few high level priorities of the incident. And so if you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, one of your overall priorities is going to be, of course, to ensure uh, the health and safety of your employees and the communities that you serve. And then secondarily, very likely to be to continue your mission critical, time sensitive business processes. Those are the arching things that are driving this response. Then what I would want to see is I want to see the overall uh, incident status as related to, related to the uh, you know count for the world, account for your state if that's important, what ha what's happening with disease transmission in your areas, and then I want to know kind of some key situational awareness about what's going on generally. Then what I want to see in this action plan is I'd like to see the very specific objectives. Think about that as a clearly written to-do list with assignments of who's responsible for each one of those tasks. And then you always want to include the operational period, which is the next meeting. So this written document literally has these four points. This should be done at the end of every operational period. Once your team has concluded the call, somebody on your team is responsible for producing this document and sending it out after every meeting. That way, when we want to get back together on our next operational period, or if you want to see who's doing what, or you want to see if something might be missing, everything is documented and it becomes kind of like a machine. My clients that are really good at doing this, oh my gosh, it's like, it's like ballet, it's quite amazing. This is an example of some COVID-19 kind of objectives you might have. Um, and again, I wanna point out a couple things about these. First of all, they are short and tightly written. We're not very wordy, we don't need to be wordy, I just need to know what the job is that needs to get done. Secondarily, look at how they're comprised with a always starting with an action oriented verb. The reason that is so important and people who've gone to my classes before know this is that if you don't use an action oriented verb at the beginning, it's not clear to the person you've given the job to what they're supposed to do. So make it super clear, determine, uh, evaluate, develop, refine, map, whatever it might be, super clear. So at the end of this, if this was actually our sample of objectives from a call that we'd been on, I would wanna organize that by team and then I'd want to have an individual's name associated with every single one of those objectives. Number three on my list, maintain, maintain, maintaining productivity while working from home. And as you can see from that image that I selected for this slide, that could be a challenge for some folks who are again, working at home with partners and parents possibly and kids and 
And yeah, it's just challenging. Now, a lot of people in my client population work from home all the time and they do it very successfully. Uh, and there's some people that don't ever work from home. And now many of my clients have deployed large numbers of people to work remotely. And just even that act alone is incredibly challenging from the area of getting people deployed to their home, setting up their workstations, making sure they have the equipment that they need, assisting them through every part of that process. And that's what a lot of companies are still struggling with. And if you haven't yet gotten to a work from home situation in your area, this might be something you should really be paying attention to now. There's a lot of logistics in working from home. And I'm, uh, I've, I've actually had a home office for uh, of my 38 years of practice, at least 25 years. And so for me, it's, I, I just do this. It's what I do for a living. But for a lot of people, it's not what they do. So it's really important that you, first of all, have real significant established work rituals in a home. And this may sound silly for many of you who probably work from home every day, but for a lot of people, they need to have a ritual. They need to have a process about how they get together and get organized for work. And they have to have a routine place to work, which means you have to be really, really thinking about ergonomics. Many of my clients are really struggling with this. All kinds of different work surfaces, people are uncomfortable at their desk, they don't have a good ergonomic or office chair, and there's a lot of ergonomic issues that are popping up. So for example, can you do virtual ergonomic assessments? Many of my clients are doing that now because they need to get people in a comfortable position so they can work. What happens when you have equipment failures? What if their laptop dies? How do you get them a new one? What if they need um, uh, new equipment, like maybe they need a peripheral, like they need, or they need a new mouse, or maybe they have a, need a scanner or a printer, and they didn't really realize that until they really started doing production work. So how do you get them things? Uh, what about your help desk support? Uh, it will very likely need to be cranked up significantly when people first are deployed home, because they're going to have a lot of questions about connecting, how to find applications, how to do certain activities. So you want to make sure that you have good, sufficient help desk support. And then what about coll collaborative tools? I mean, some people in many organizations might be using IMs all, just as a routine practice. Many folks are using things like Slack, uh, but you could also be using collaborative uh, tools like MS Teams. So what are you using that you can allow people to connect, to collaborate on work projects, um, and be able to feel like they're part of the team that they normally work with? So some of the challenges that we've seen in our client population already are, are these that I'm, I, I've got displayed on this slide. And that's, first of all, is for people trying to stay organized and motivated. Uh, there's an interesting process I see going on about this pandemic, and that is that it's, it's really dawning on people at different times how significant or how big this whole story is. And for some people, there are waves of, of, of insecurity and, and waves of, of anxiety. And so sometimes you'll find that people are not as organized or motivated as they could be. And some of it could simply be because of this incident. But it could also frankly be because they have a household full of people, they're trying to do their job, they're managing their kids, they're working with homeschooling now that everybody's learning remotely. So there's lots of different demands that are gonna make it difficult for folks to stay on point at work. So coordinating the family demands can be a big issue. Some people feel very disconnected, uh, like they're not, they're floating out in space uh, and they don't feel like they're part of the team anymore or they don't feel like they're part of the project uh, because they're just sitting in their living room by themselves. And so that can be hard for people to stay motivated. And then lastly, some people are getting burned out. And I will tell you, some of my clients who've been doing this for a long time, a uh, couple of months, are really getting burned out. And you really have to think about making sure that your people are taking care of themselves. They're getting the rest they need. They're stopping. They're working on their ergonomics. They're taking care of things that they need to in order to be able to stay whole. Because we need everybody here for the long fight. So a couple of tips I would really have you think about is first of all, um, self-care. Now, I'm going to sound like I'm your mom, uh, probably, but uh, these are things that you should be thinking about every day. First of all, stopping, taking some deep breaths, getting some air into your lungs as we get very anxious, as this 
pandemic unfolds, we're going to stop breathing. And you need to really think about how you can take care of yourself. Stop, take clear your mind, take a couple of just big, deep breaths, walk around the block, do something that just sort of clears your mind. The frequent stretching and movement is really important, especially if you're sitting in a chair that wasn't designed as an office chair, and maybe you're hunched over your dining room table, your, your shoulders are up near your ears, and your back is all rounded. Get up, uh, take a conference call standing, move around. Uh, you need to have movement daily, and especially in these trying times. Think about your nutrition. Don't be having a bag of Doritos for lunch. Uh, think about what you're eating and the impact that has on your overall health and well-being and also your performance. It's really important to get exercise. Even when we're sheltering at home, we still have permission to go out and walk. So do that. Be mindful, of course, of six feet and social distancing, but get out and move around so that you can, again, feel whole in your body. And then lastly, think about practicing some mindfulness. Again, clearing your mind, relaxing it, just, just thinking about these important issues that we're all working on. If you used to commute a long time when you went to work, think about what you could do with that commute time. Yeah, I know you could go to work and you could work all day long and longer, but maybe what you do is you uh, decide you're gonna exercise that time that you would normally commute, or maybe you're gonna read some inspirational piece of literature, or you're gonna do something with your kids because after all, it's your commute time. And then you get yourself all ready and then you go to work, plop yourself down on the dining room table and there you go. How about connecting with your colleagues? Uh, we need to feel like we're part of a team and a group. So um, how can you do that? One of the things I would tell you is just pick up the phone and call them. <laughs> what a concept, right? Uh, don't IM them, don't send them a text message, don't email them, just call them. Hear a human voice, connect with people in that space. Uh, it's actually delightful. Um, you might have a virtual lunch. So if you if you haven't seen your colleagues in a while, why don't you have a date on Zoom with uh, and everybody has lunch. You sit down at your dining room table, you all have sandwiches or whatever, and you talk about what's happening in your life. Some of my clients actually who use things like Slack or Zoom or other uh, uh, collaborative tools uh, actually have started kind of an informal uh, chat line, if you will. People will drop in like suggestions like a movie they saw last night or something that they heard on the news or maybe a recipe or I mean, the idea is have some way that you can have that kind of water cooler conversation that we used to have, right? And then lastly, some of my clients have been having after work cocktail parties, whether they're drinking alcohol or non-alcohol, but the idea is to hang with your friends. A lot of this is done on Zoom and they just chat about, well, they chat about whatever comes up. So think about those ways that you can connect with your colleagues and your work teams so that we all feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. Number four on my list is protecting critical employees on the job. This goes without saying, if you don't protect them, they're not coming. And why would they? So many of my clients are in businesses of which they have to have people on the job, whether it's a, a trading floor that needs to have people show up because of the type of equipment that might be physically on that property, whether it might be things such as uh, uh, city or uh, county governments, could be utilities, uh, healthcare. There's many people who have to show up. So how do you protect critical employees who are on the job? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but really important for us to reflect for a moment. Obviously, social distancing. Now, there's some professions, of course, where social distancing is not po po possible, like in healthcare. And if you can't social distance, then you have to have the appropriate personal protective equipment to ensure their safety. That has become increasingly challenging, as you well know, because of the worldwide shortage on hospital equipment, masks, gloves, gowns, and so on. It's really important that you have intense surface cleaning so that you want to make sure that you have adequate janitorial coverage in order for your folks to have the areas that they're using all the time cleaned. And what I would also say is you want to provide cleaning solutions and products so that they can clean their areas themselves as well on top of janitorial cleaning so that they feel comfortable. If you can't find janitorial supplies, you can go to the CDC site and, and see the recipe for bleach and water, which is essentially one part bleach to nine parts water, placing that into a spray bottle, and that can be used for intense cleaning. However, of course, the downside about bleach is it could also ruin clothing as well. So just keep that in mind. 
Many of my clients are doing transport, actually providing transportation for people as one option, or uh, even in some of my clients in New York have been renting cars for people because they don't have a car and they have to come to work and they don't want to take public transit. So you need to help them with transportation to the best of your ability, and you want to make sure that they have the safest and most convenient place to park so they can immediately get into the work environment. And then some of my clients are now talking about having on-site uh, employee assistance program counselors available because people are stressed out. And so whether they're physically available, probably not, but virtually available would be more likely. And you want to make sure that that's available to individuals if they need that kind of assistance at work. And, you know, many of us are going to need somebody to talk to. And I think having EAP available uh, is going to be really important. There's another type of protecting employees, and it's something called sequestration. Now, you may have heard that term before. What does it mean to actually sequester an employee? I only have a couple of clients who are actually doing this. Uh, the utilities are pretty much now planning that uh, nationwide for mission-critical employees running nuclear power plants and control rooms. But I also have some clients in the financial services area that are sequestering people because of the unique skills they have related to financial markets and trading. So. Um, and what this means essentially is that you know, the employer, obviously with the employee's permission, removes them from their life. That's the most successful sequestration, where you remove them from their life, you provide them a housing, you provide them meals, you provide them all the medical support they need, any recreation. You basically take them and drop them into an environment. Some people are placing them in trailers and bringing them onto properties. Others are doing things such as renting an entire hotel or motel area. Uh, but the key thing is you have to separate them from their life. Some people are trying to do this in my employee population or my client population, but they're um, let, letting people stay at home. That's a little more challenging because you don't have as much control over who might come by, uh, which then kind of kills the aspect of sequestration. Uh, and also it includes hazard pay or some significant bonus because of this hardship. And it could go on for weeks um, at a time. Number five on my list is redeploying workers to departments that need help. You know, you've got some people at home that are uh, not doing anything and other people that are working really hard. So likely you have some people that are not working, but uh, how can you deploy those to other people who need it? And so uh, what I'm asking you to think about is think of a job bank. I'm calling it your own version of Craigslist. So you need to think about tools, first of all, that you could use to facilitate collecting these needs and resources. So, you know, people that are maybe have certain skills and then you need to match them up and determine what departments actually need help and what kind of help do they need. And then you want to, what you essentially are going to do is list all the employees who are unable to perform their routine job and give some sort of skill inventory like skilled in PowerPoint or really good at Excel or whatever it might be. And then you need some folks to sort of do this dating game, if you will, or matching them up. This could easily be done by managers or in concert with HR. But what I want you to think about is that the work still needs to get done. Some departments are super busy and their hair is on fire and there's people sitting around that can help them. How can we redeploy those folks to help the people that have the greatest need? Number six on my list is evaluating your human resource decisions. This is gonna be, I'll just tell you right now, an ongoing story. And there's a laundry list of things I could talk about, but I'm just gonna talk about a few. So uh, you should have already addressed, obviously, the issues that are required by the new federal guidelines. Uh, I think about pays and benefits and work rules and hazard pay and what if there's an illness in a family, childcare, all that thing. That should already be addressed. But that also has a limited time window. So keep that in mind. If employees are being paid, now this is something I'm starting to see in some of my clients, is that employees are being paid, whether they're working or not. So, you know, employee A is working in, and employee B is not, they're both getting paid, you can begin to already see what can happen over time, which is some friction between the working people who are getting paid and the non-working people that are getting paid. And they're wondering like, well, what's in it for me? I'm working and I, I could be sitting home doing nothing and get the same amount of money. So this is gonna be an issue that will develop over time. So what are your responses to that? Are you gonna pay people additional, additional hazard pay? Uh, what, what, what's your solution? And what are you saying? What are your communication strategies related to this? And then I think you need to clearly be uh, focused on how often are you revisiting the decisions that you made? So if you're paying everybody now, are you gonna continue to do that on week uh, three, week four, week five, and so on? 
And it's really important because your employees are thinking about this, that you are thinking about it, communicating it, um, and you are, you are ready to make decisions if there's a change and then informing your employees as soon as possible. I would really encourage you to have a small group of HR professionals that are working together with all the other players like legal and so on that are really gonna peel back these issues and develop a variety of decision trees and strategies to address them. Because the length and pay uh, that you can pay and the time you will continue benefits will be different under different scenarios. So I think you need to be prepared now about what you're gonna do if this goes on for 15 days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days or more. Number seven, uh, ongoing communication to all of your key stakeholders. This is absolutely critical. People are hungry for information about what's going on with your business, what's going on with their jobs, um, and your customers wanna hear how you're doing. So I would strongly encourage that you've got a well-designed communi designed communication strategy and plan right now. And that as part of that strategy and plan, you've got a communication schedule that you can now share with everybody that's on your crisis management team. And as you can see by the image that's on the right-hand side, that could be comprised of the following. I would like to know what the deliverables are. Well, first of all, who are all the key, key stakeholders, which could be customers, regulators, uh, it could be employees, and the list would go on. Media, social, traditional, et cetera. I'd like to know what are all the major stakeholders that would be going down the far left-hand side. I'd like to know what the deliverables are. So are you writing a press release? Are you writing an email? What is it? I'd like to know how it's going to get delivered. I'd like to know what kind of frequency. Are we doing daily comms, weekly comms? Who owns that communication and is responsible for that? And then really, who is the target audience? This kind of document would be so helpful because it would tell everybody really what we're running towards as far as the communication, and it also helps push strategy to the communicators so they can get out the right information. So this daily refinement is going to be really important. And I would say also that you want to be also looking at your talking points, those identified holding statements that you've approved, and you want to make sure that you're assessing them daily, sometimes maybe even more than once a day, based on what's happening on the ground. And as this continues to escalate and the cases really start to pile up in the United States in particular, this is gonna become even more important. Oh, number eight's one of my favorites and I rarely see it done. I think it's probably one of the most effective things that a, a team could have. And I'll tell you in this pandemic, you're gonna need one. And that's what's called a plan B team. First of all, what is this concept? This is actually became initially pretty famous when the CDC utilized it during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009. Uh, it's basically pulling together a group of individuals that have a deep knowledge of the business, but they are not actively involved in managing the crisis. So they're not on the crisis management team. And what they can do is you basically take this group of indi individuals and they're going to huddle, if you will, and they need to really be objectively looking at the strategy, the direction we're going, the decisions that we're making, and asking the big questions like, is this the best way to do it? Is there another way we could do this? And what are the options in actually getting to the end of our goal? The, the plan B team is really important because in a sustained crisis, they're gonna constantly be re reviewing the decisions you're making and the overall strategy. They're gonna really give you some feedback, uh, assuming the leadership wants to hear it. And that's the other thing is that the leaders have to be willing to hear what somebody has to say. And then they can really support leadership in a very objective manner where nobody else can because everybody else is kind of in the pool. So a plan B team is super helpful for any complex and very lengthy activation, just like COVID-19. And the reason why is this, first of all, those of us that are in the, in the, in the fight, so to speak, really trying to manage this, we cannot see the forest for the trees anymore. And so we are too involved in the decisions, we're too involved in the problems, and we can't see clearly the situation as a whole anymore. And so this uncertainty sometimes gives us some sense of disorientation, some sort of confusion. We think we understand what's going on, but maybe we don't. Um, and so because of that, leaders begin to behave in ways and have mindsets that cause us to sometimes overreact. And we need somebody else to give us a hand, but we may not know it. And that's the challenging part. And that's what a plan B team can do for you. We do lose our objectivity over time because we actually fall in love with our ideas, which is always a problem. So leaders 
who are not caught up in the day-to-day -day operation can provide you the best objective feedback. So whether that's maybe a group of individuals that are you know, good subject matter experts, really smart individuals, have some length of time with the organization that can be huddled, and their job is to peer into the box where we're all working and looking at the decisions, the strategies and processes we're doing and asking the question, could this be done better? Are they making the right decisions? You need to have one of these right now. Absolutely essential. Number nine, the continual deep reevaluation. And I want to say this is this is, should be an ongoing process. In a crisis, you're going to have to evaluate what's going on. But in a pandemic, it's even deeper. Because of the nature, the scope, and the duration, which I talked about earlier, you're going to have to ask yourself probably every day and sometimes twice a day, are we doing the right stuff? Should we be doing all the things that we're doing? What is the most mission critical, time sensitive business process? So what can you stop doing? And then two days later or that afternoon, you have to ask it again, and you're going to keep asking it over and over and over. And the list may grow small over time. And then number 10, I think you should start writing your after action report now. And you might think, well, that's really crazy. No, it's not. Uh, this is what I would suggest to you. I've already had, I've been counseling some of my clients on the, about this already. Many of us have realized that there's a ton of things that were done at the beginning that were big mistakes or it didn't work or the plan was a problem or whatever it was. And you know that, but you haven't written it down anywhere. So what I'm advocating is this. There's probably a lot of stuff you've learned, things you want to fix, things you want to change, uh, but you're not going to remember anything because our brains are going to turn into mush after a while. So you should start capturing this right now. You should open a Word document right now on your computer and you should start writing down everything that you want to change, modify, it's not working, and literally have a punch list of all the issues that you need to fix, address, modify in some way. Put a timestamp on it, uh, maybe a few notes about the problem just to jog your memory. And then once this is all over, whenever that is, uh, you can actually then take this document and actually review and develop that after action report. If you don't do this now, you're not going to remember 90% of what has happened because we're going to be tired when it's all over. Lastly, before we take questions, I just want to ask to talk about personal and family preparedness. I think this is critically important. After all, diseases are personal and they're about your family. So these are all things that we know, but I just beg you, beg you, beg you, wash your hands a lot. And then if you don't think you've washed them enough, wash them again. Avoid touching your hands and face. Yes, it is really hard to stop. I've gotten really good at it. I sit on my hands half the day. Uh, don't be around sick people unless of course they're in your family. But if you have sick people in your family, then I would really encourage you to isolate them to the best of your ability, put them in their own bedroom, give them their own bath if possible bring the meals to where they are. The idea is to minimize uh, being in close contact to the best of your ability. Obviously, if you're in healthcare, that's not an option that you have. If you have hand sanitizer, always have a, uh, some in your bag or in your pocket when you're in the public, uh, when there's no hand washing available, uh, and be smart. If you wear a mask, there's only two occasions really to wear one. One is if, you're, are, if you yourself are ill and people might be caring for you, obviously in your home that would be helpful. If you have a sick person, put a mask on them so you can assist them. And then also, frankly, um, if, you're, if you are caring for somebody who's sick, I'd, I'd like a mask on myself as well. And of course, we don't really have to talk about planes anymore because no one's flying. Um, and lastly, I would just ask all of you to be smart and not to panic. Uh, there's gonna be a lots of ups and downs in this experience. And we just need to continually uh, be calm, be smart, and not to panic. Lastly, um, I really beg you to think about this, that you have to be prepared for the long haul. I am sure many of us now understand that, but I don't know what you're doing about it. By the way, I'm speaking to myself just as much as I'm talking to you, in case you're wondering. Uh, the importance of pacing yourself is absolutely essential. Uh, this is going to go on for weeks. I've been getting up at 4 a.m. Uh, every day to work since January 10th. So, long time. Um, be aware of your fatigue, your staff's fatigue, uh, your team's fatigue. You need to have a staffing chart and you need to have replacements. You need to have backup. You cannot do this day on day. So, please, please, please think about the long haul. Think about what happens if somebody gets sick. 
If there's cross training that needs to happen so people can do a task, get on it. Uh, we don't have much time. So on that note, I'm going to take questions. But before I do that, I just want to say, uh, if any of you do not follow me on LinkedIn, I would ask that you sign up and follow me because I actually post a lot every day on COVID-19, a lot of data and tips that might be helpful for you. So I would encourage you to do that. So I'm going to hand it over to Bob. And Bob, uh, do we have any questions I could take? We certainly do. There's tons of them coming in. And if we don't get to your question here today, uh, there's a couple opportunities. You can reach out to Regina directly or uh, we will be launching a new discussion board on DRG.com that will help uh, kind of uh, answer and address a ton of the questions that pop up, uh, especially around this COVID-19 scenario. So get to as many as we can here in a few minutes. Uh, first question, are there HIPAA related issues in collecting information on employees uh, medical conditions? The, the main HIPAA related issues if you then are sharing that information. So for example, if you're collecting information about employees and illness, when we ask you to do a situation status um, uptake, if you will, or get information from your locations, we don't need to know the name of the person. We just need to know how many employees that have COVID-19 or are either in quarantine for COVID-19. Uh, but in particular, you might wanna know what business areas they come from. So I think you have to be careful about taking names and what you might do with them. But uh, if you're not doing uh, name collection, then that's not an issue. If you are collecting names, I would ask you, why are you doing that? And what can you do to not share that with anybody outside of HR and the manager? All right, perfect. Next question. What consideration should we plan for when locations reduce their stay at home orders, but the threat of COVID-19 still exists? That is what I call the personal moral decision. So your leadership has to really decide what they would do. So for example, and this is probably a big issue because President Trump has been saying that the, uh, the restrictions might be removed by Easter. If all of a sudden you hear that, um, that uh, things have shifted and changed and that restrictions have been removed, you have to then ask yourself the question, well, how is it different in my areas? Am I going to turn things back on and have everybody go back to work when I might just then continue to worsen the problem? So I think leaders, your most senior executives have to really be looking at this daily about what's happening in your area, what's your risk appetite, what are you going to say to people if you bring them back? And I would just say, I've had a client of mine, I had a conversation with yesterday, they were talking about reopening an office in an area. And, I, and my question was to them, well, what, 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 what made you make that decision? What made you decide it was safer that people could come back? Because you're going to have to give a really good explanation to your employees about why you're turning an office back on when indeed the disease is still around us everywhere. All right, there was a question uh, wanting def uh, definition on what the holding statement is. That's a great question. So holding statements in crisis communications, what you're looking for is probably uh, a series of bullet points and maybe there could be as small as two or three and maybe as many as 10. So a holding statement literally would be these key critical pieces of information that then all of the commu communications would be built from. And the idea about having these holding statements is your executives approve those holding statements in concert with legal counsel and the communications team. And then the communication teams use those approved statements to then build all of the communications, which then, then means that you don't have to have everything approved because they're built on these bricks, if you will, the foundation are what are called the holding statements. All right, we'll take one more question here. How do you ensure that Team B is respected and not overridden when they provide input or recommendations? Wow, that is a great question and super loaded. So a couple things I would say to you is that probably who needs to bless the Team B a group more than anyone else is the CEO. Now, if the CEO takes, takes, uh, takes issue with them, that provides you with a different problem. But what I would say is that when the Team B group is pulled together, I would want the most senior people of your company looking at that group saying, yep, that's the right group, and that's what you want. They should be endorsing the Team B group. If indeed the CEO has a problem with what they're saying, they have to work that out amongst the CEO and the Team B group. But I want executive leader, leadership to say that's the team, that's the right composition, those are the individuals I want, and then they need to be hooked together with your crisis management team as they go forward. All right, wonderful. There's many, many questions here that are coming in. Again, if we do not get to your question, uh, you can follow up with us directly, or you can, again, post that to the discussion board that will be live on drj.com early next week, or you can reach out directly to Regina. So any parting words here today, Regina? I wish everybody to be safe. I want you to pay attention, get your good situational awareness, and um, stay healthy.
All right, wonderful. Thanks again, everyone, for your attendance here today. We again hope you gather some great information from today's webinar. DRJ would also like to thank Regina and EMS Solutions for her time here today, as well as Everbridge for sponsoring today's webinar. We will be emailing everyone a link to this recording. You may view that recording as frequently as you wish or share it with your peers. Thank you again, and this now ends today's webinar.